<laughs> I definitely should have had a cocktail. I had to. Or I'm waiting to laugh. Tony right here in honor of Kendra. Uh, what? I have sparkling water. It's so sad. Hello, everyone. Welcome. We are so thrilled to have you joining us tonight on this Monday night discussion about restaurants in the pandemic. Thanks for supporting the Flatirons Food Film Festival. You probably are aware by now that this is our eighth annual festival and it has been so much fun. We've been going since last Thursday. And if you have fear of missing out, buy yourself a pass and uh, watch some of the movies that we already saw. You'll be able to see um, recordings of the discussions afterwards and you can do that all week. So we're still going till Friday. So thank you for joining us. My name is Megan and I own Local Table Tours, which is a food tour company. And uh, I've been a supporter of this festival for seven years now. And uh, I'm really interested in listening to this discussion tonight because something that became clear to me during this pandemic is that I have a business model for the last decade that is completely built upon the strength of restaurants. And when restaurants fall apart, uh, businesses like mine fall apart. So, um, you know, we're all plugging along and I think most of you tuning in are probably have your finger on the pulse, a little bit of what's going on in the food scene. But what we have today is gonna be an excellent panel discussion led by Sarah Brito. And she's gonna be able to introduce uh, herself and everything that she's doing with the Good Food Media Network and a uh, star studded bunch of entrepreneurs. We have things from fast casual to fine dining to places that have decided to shutter due to the pandemic. So it's going to be interesting and um, thank you for tuning in. If you do have questions that you want them to address, do remember that you can type them into the discussion part into your uh, whatever your streaming service is here and they'll come up in our chat and they'll be able to talk to you about that. So Without further ado, I will pass the mic to Sarah. Thank you, Megan. And welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. And as Megan said, we have a great uh, panel lined up for all of you. I'm Sarah Brito, for those of you that don't know me and who I don't know in the audience, we can't see who's here necessarily. Um, I'm the co-founder of the Good Food Media Network and our mission is to educate and inspire eaters by cultivating a conversation and community around the people and businesses changing the food system for good. People like the panelists that we're so lucky are joining us around the virtual table this evening. Restaurant people are my people. So I am especially honored to have been asked to facilitate this important and timely conversation on the topic of local restaurants and the pandemic. And I imagine that if you've been participating in the Flatiron Food Film Festival and are here with us this evening, like me, you probably already know that restaurants are the heart and soul of our communities. What you may not know is that restaurants are also the backbone of our local, state, and regional economy. Right here in Colorado, every dollar restaurants spend has a greater than $2 or 2X impact on the Colorado economy. A finding that we reported in our 2020 Good Food 100 Restaurants Industry Impact Report, which is conducted by the Business Research Division of the Leeds School of Business right here in our backyard at CU Boulder. So if you understand that restaurants are the heart and soul of our communities, and the backbone of our economy. As Megan said in her intro, when restaurants are hurting, we all hurt. The COVID-19 global pandemic and economic crisis have made one thing more clear than ever. No one link in the food chain can be healthy until every link in the food chain is healthy. We're all connected and that includes restaurants and restaurant workers. So before I introduce our panelists, I'd like to just share a little bit about how I've prepared 
and plan to approach tonight's conversation. Uh, besides being inspired by restaurants, like many of you, I was also very inspired by the poet Amanda Gorman's reading of her poem, The Hill We Climb, during the inauguration just a couple of weeks ago. So since it's still early in the year, meaning there's still plenty of time to get inspired and get stuff done, and today happens to be the first day of February and the first day of Black History Month, I've chosen to use Amanda Gorman's poem about our country as a metaphor for the hill we climb in the restaurant industry as we explore where we are today and how we can move forward. So with that, I'd like to introduce and welcome our panelists. Joining me around our virtual table this evening to talk local restaurants and the pandemic are Kendra Anderson. And since we can't hear your applause, I'm going to uh, introduce everyone and then I'll uh, give everyone a, another warm welcome uh, at the end. But starting with Kendra Anderson, who you may not have seen in our promotional materials, um, but we were so excited that she was able and interested in joining us tonight. Kendra is the owner and operator of Bar Helix and Cabana X, uh, founder and managing partner of MQ Consulting Group. Next, we have Caroline Glover. Caroline Glover is the chef and owner of Annette in Denver, Colorado. Chef Caroline was named a 2019 Food and Wine Magazine Best New Chef and was a 2020 James Beard Award nominee for Best New Chef in the Mountain Region. Annette was also featured on the 2020 Good Food 100 Restaurants list. Next, we have Jimmy Seidel. Jimmy is the founder of Snarf Sandwiches, a great lover of sandwiches and food, and he currently has 23 sandwich shops and three burger stands in three states. So Jimmy joins us as uh, the restaurateur with the most number of restaurants uh, and representing the most number of states. So we'll get a, a multi-state perspective from him. Bobby Stuckey. Bobby Stuckey is a master sommelier and owner of the Frosca Hospitality Group. Frosca, that, which includes Frosca Food and Wine, Pizzeria Locale Boulder, Tavernetta, and Sunday Vinyl. He's also the owner of Scarpetta Wines. And Frosca Food and Wine was also featured on the 2020 Good Food 100 restaurants list. And last but not least, uh, Dana Query. Dana is the creative cat, which when I first read that, I thought, is that an abbreviation? Or is that like her nickname, the creative cat? Uh, and the owner at Big Red F Restaurant Group. Big Red F was founded in Boulder and has 13 restaurants, including Jack's Fish House, The Post Brewing Company, Centro Mexican Kitchen, West End Tavern, and Lola Coastal Mexican. Dana also is very active in the community and sits on the board of the Boulder Chamber, Boulder County Farmers Market, Eat Denver, and the Colorado Restaurant Association. So as you can see, we really do have the who's who of the Boulder and Denver restaurant community. So welcome to all of you. Thank you. Little round of applause for everybody. Did I hear? <laughs> Great. Okay. So um, we have about 45 to 50 minutes. Um, and of course, if people are super engaged with lots of questions, uh, we're all willing to stay a little bit longer. Um, but as I mentioned, I'd like to start our conversation with where we are today. Um, and so I'll begin and preface uh, my first question uh, with the opening lines of the hill we climb. The hill we climb. When day comes, we ask ourselves, where can we find light in this never ending shade? The loss we carry, a sea we must wade. So reflecting on those words and on the brutal year of 2020, which is only a month behind us, I'd like to ask each of our panelists, uh, and they can take this in any order that they would like, so just jump in, uh, no need to raise your hand, um, but I'd like to ask each of you to share your personal story of the loss that you and your business carry and the sea that you're waiting. That could include telling us about the current status and the situation of your business. 
how many employees you might have had to furlough or lay off, um, and if any of you have actually had to close locations or your business altogether uh, in the past year. So who would like to start us off? Don't be shy. I know all of you. <laughs> I'll start. Great. Thank you, Dana. Sure. Um, so a quick anecdote. When um, March, I think it was 16th, happened, Dave, my husband, who is the founder of Big Red F, I felt weird when you said owner of Big Red F. I was like, oh, man. Um, he was actually sick. And it was early March, it was mid-March, and no one suspected when you were sick that you had COVID at that point. Um, but he was sick. And uh, so we went on lockdown personally, we were in quarantine. And then um, on uh, starting March 14th, and then March 16th, everything shut down. So on March 17th, we furloughed over 600 employees, while we were both at that point sick. Um, you know, we didn't know it was COVID at that time, but we knew that we were pretty sick. Um, so we were sick at home, quarantined and furloughing 600 plus employees. We were able to keep um, 100 employees and we closed nine restaurants. We kept uh, five open for takeout and delivery and all of the 100 employees, it was a lot of Jack's um, salary managers all went into the four post locations and, um, and the one Weston Tavern uh, location. So for us, the loss was, it was just at such a, a insane time. You know, the world was shutting down and, and this was obviously way before we had any lifeline from uh, government help or any support. And um, I'll get to, this is a question, an answer to question two, but you know, restaurants are a cash flow business. So um, we immediately were you know, over a million dollars in debt and it was, uh, and we had to you know, furlough that many people. So um, it was probably the most significant loss that you could experience, I think, personally. We also were really afraid because we didn't know if we had COVID or not. And we, did, we heard about people dying. And um, there was a moment when actually Dave was, had gotten the sickest that he got when the news came through that that um, I was a chef. Everyone will know his name, but yes, who was not very old and he, he had died from COVID. And so, um, so yeah, it, and it was on Dave's birthday, actually. Dave's birthday is March 19th. So it was a crazy, crazy time for us. And I'm sure it doesn't compare to a lot of people around the world and what they were going through when, they're, when everything shut down for them. But that's kind of a snippet into what happened in our story. Wow, thank you for sharing. I guess I could try my try a shot at this. Um, I guess it was early February when you know we were seeing some science, uh, conversation about COVID in China, and my team and I started talking about how we might handle if if it comes to our way and what my, what we would have to do to keep the business going, and uh, you know that. My restaurant, I'm sure everybody's restaurants, it's, it's all about your, your people that work for you. And, you know, you invest a lot of time and training with, and with them. And certainly we do. And, you know, we had to make a hard decision. Uh, if, if this was gonna happen, we wanted to keep the doors open and, and, and have the ability to deliver the food. And we immediately, uh, about March 15th, I guess it happened, uh, we had to let go of half our staff um, and really hunker down, asked a lot of the team to, uh, you know, pick up the slack. It, you know, it was a very difficult time, very scary. And, uh, you know, to see all those people being let go was very difficult, but, you know, thankfully within about a month, month and a half, we were able to bring back most of our employees uh, and, and reestablish the business uh, pretty much. Uh, we started out as a uh, takeout and delivery business for the most part. So we have had experience. We're not, we're not a fine dining restaurant, you know, we're grab and go. So 
essentially, uh, you know, that, that was a scary part and that was like a loss that we were potentially looking at. And, you know, so. Thank you for sharing that. Um, since you mentioned uh, fine dining, um, should we jump over to you, Bobby, to get a fine dining um, perspective? Sure. Um, well, thank you everybody for being here with us tonight. Um, you know, March 16th, I think uh, we were hearing that we were gonna get closed down. Um, coming from a family in insurance, my father was in insurance. The first thing I did was as soon as I had the the mayor of Denver's order, I sent in for business interruption insurance and I did not, could not believe um, that we got a denial for our business interruption within about 10 minutes. And being someone who grew up in the insurance business, I knew right off the bat something was up. I called my dad and he's like, you're fucked. <laughs> the fact that an insurance company can give a denial in 10 minutes they've been planning this for two months. Like you just can't email a call center. That's not how business interruption insurance goes. So then I knew that, wow, uh, this is maybe a bigger deal than I thought. Um, and uh, we, we closed all four restaurants. Uh, we, we furloughed uh, the 225 employees. We furloughed everybody, but the executive team, uh, I, was very, very scared for my staff. So I made a commitment. I knew, we didn't know what Boulder County was about, but we knew that Mayor Hancock had said, you're gonna be closed at least till May 15th. So I furloughed everyone so I could pay their insurance. And I, I made a commitment to pay everyone's insurance through June. So everyone could, all 200 employees that were furloughed knew that they had insurance. And then the next day I was on a phone call with a couple restaurant tours and this is where the whole thing got really weird. Uh, we founded the uh, Independent Restaurant Coalition because I really found out um, that our industry um, does not have a great advocacy in DC and that we only had one advocacy group and they are for everything from McDonald's to a single Korean barbecue shop in Queens. And that advocacy can't really work for everybody. And then we started the Independent Restaurant Coalition and that's kind of where this whole year has been for me. I, every morning at 7.30, I've, been, I've gotten prepared for my our phone calls uh, and talking to legislation and, and, and I think I've spoken to over a hundred Congress people and senators or their staffs. Um, and, you know, we, we currently right now have three of our four restaurants open uh, Sunday vinyl because of the 25% occupancy and the narrowness of that space. We need to be at least 50% to be able to open that. So we're planning, we're hedging a bet that we could possibly have it open by mid March. Um, but one thing I do want to say is as hard as it is for the owners, um, being an entrepreneur, you're, you're, you're someone who deals with risk. What I, what I have a huge um, worry about is all the 11 million employees across the United States. I just saw that my friend Carolyn Stein lost someone to co an employee to COVID today. Um, the, the stress on this incredible cornerstone of America workforce has been able to, has been dealing with something that no one can imagine. Um, you know, I was working with the team two Saturdays. We're in a snowstorm, running uh, fondue pots out into yurts. Um, it's just not what these employees across the country. Uh, it's really, really tough and it's really stressful for them. And that stresses me out. Not just my employees. I worry about all 11 million employees across the country and, and the situation that we're in. Yeah, thank you, Bobby, for sharing that. Um, Caroline, I'd now like to jump to you um, because I wanna leave Kendra's story as sort of the, the, the finale uh, of this uh, question. Um, and Caroline, you and your husband 
Nelson um, are the, to me, the epitome of the small husband and wife run neighborhood restaurants. So what's it been like from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, our experience has been similar to everybody else's. I think in our, we're based in Aurora, so um, we were a couple of days ahead getting shut down. So I think March 13th, um, Friday the 13th, we got um, word that the city was gonna be shutting us down within the next 24 hours. So I had been talking to um, Brady, the chef of Canlis at the time. I had seen them pivoting really fast. Um, and just for our audience, Canlis is in Seattle. Right. Yeah. And so I, I had been reaching out to him for the past two weeks, just saying, how are you doing this? What are you doing? Even though our restaurants are not similar at all um, in terms of a lot of different things. But um, when we were told, I think it was on Saturday, the 14th, that that would be our last day of service for a month. Um, it was probably the worst service I've ever had. Um, I didn't want to let employees know um, right at the beginning of service, but we're a super tiny restaurant. I work the line, my emotions show. And so my, my staff could feel something was about to happen. And after service, I gathered everybody and I just bawled. Um, I didn't, I was like, I have never been through this. Um, I don't know what's going on. I'm going to have to furlough everybody. We kept just our management team on. Um, and I asked a ton of them. I cut their salary by a lot um, and asked them to work so many hours and help me kind of pivot into this takeout. Um, but to piggyback on what Bobby was saying, you know, we've been doing outdoor dining and what we're asking of our employees right now, um, it's, it's hard. It's hard to ask employees to be out you know, in these conditions, if it's snowing, if it's, you know, 19 degrees, which that was like on Wednesday night, coming in and out, um, you know, the, the pressure that I feel like my employees are feeling right now, I, I can't even imagine. I, I feel pressure myself, but um, they're working in conditions that I never imagined I would ask anybody to work in. Um, and the fact that they've stuck through it and we've had turnover because it's, it, it's horrible. Um, you know, we're trying to create the best experience that we can indoors and outdoors, but um, on top of all these weather conditions, there's still the, we're, we're still, you know, involved with the public. We're, we're still putting ourselves at risk um, so we can survive. And I feel like that to me is the hardest thing right now. Thank you, Caroline. And last but not least, both in terms of being invited to join our conversation, um, but the way the conversation ended up flowing, I really did want to save your story for last, uh, Kendra, because um, you're the only bar owner uh, in this conversation, and, and you probably have the most extreme story um, of your experience. Um, I don't know about that. Uh, I think everyone's story is, is pretty tough. Um, I feel like I'm sort of, I have a lot in common with what everyone said, but I'll begin with what, what Bobby mentioned, which is that as, as a bar, you know, Bar Helix had about a thousand square feet of, of guest space. Um, and so right away, as soon as we had to close our doors, first of all, we weren't known to be a restaurant. Um, while I think our food was fantastic, that certainly wasn't the main draw. And so as soon as we were told we had to close, um, at that point, it was still illegal to sell alcohol um, for off-premise consumption as, as a restaurant or a bar. And so I, I, of course, was completely just flabbergasted. I thought, well, there's nothing I can do. Um, but just a few days later, of course, um, we learned that we would be able to sell alcohol to go. And so the first pivot that we did was simply to begin um, batching and selling um, our pretty well-known Negroni cocktail program, as well as some of other craft cocktails. And, and that seemed okay. I was able to keep a couple of employees, but did have to furlough about 10. Um, but quickly it became clear that, um, especially in the middle of winter, people really were, were looking for food. They were looking for comfort. They were looking for something more substantial um, than a very elevated cocktail. And so we then created um, a takeout only um, barbecue, kind of a smoke out concept 
totally nothing we had ever done. No, none of that food had ever been on any of our menus. Um, and it was actually food I used to do 110 years ago when I had a catering business. So we started doing the Helix smoke out. We did that from about the first week of April until the uh, last week of May when we were told we were gonna be able to reopen for, for outdoor dining. And so I took a few days off, um, took my team up to the mountains and we invented an entirely new all outdoor restaurant concept that I was going to operate in a vacant restaurant space up the street from Bar Helix because I didn't have a very large patio. Um, again, my indoor space was obviously very small. And so I knew that there was a large vacant restaurant with an extremely large patio in my same um, community. And just, I don't even really know quite how I figured it out, but we ended up launching an entirely new restaurant concept um, up the street from us um, called Cabana X. And we ran that from uh, the first week of June until the middle of October. Um, when October arrived and it became uh, clear that the weather was changing and I also needed to return the space I was borrowing, um, I reached out to my landlord and I just said, um, we're exhausted. We haven't stopped working for six or seven months. Um, and I think I have some new ideas for what I can do to take my concept back inside to my thousand square foot space that I can operate at maybe 25%, but I need a little time to try and figure it out. Um, and basically he said no. And at that point demanded full repayment of the rent that I, he had told me I didn't need to worry about for the duration of the time we had been mostly closed. I mean, essentially not making any revenue. And I had used all of my cash reserves to even get us to October. Um, and he just, he gave me three days um, to pay the full amount that I owed or vacate the space. So wow. that was that. And so how many, not only did you have to close your business, but about how many employees then also lost their livelihood because you as an owner had to close your business? That's right. Um, so 12 people, again, we never had a huge team because even when I opened Cabana, which was um, essentially the same number of seats as I would have had full occupancy at Bar Helix, only about um, 60 seats. Uh, it, we still, we just ran it really lean um, and, and we really only had 12 people, but we were all shocked because we, we just weren't expecting it. We weren't planning for it. We had found creative ways, three creative ways to keep our doors open when many restaurateurs closed for months. Um, and I just felt like I just needed a minute uh, and that I was absolutely going to be able to make it work. And um, we just didn't get that opportunity, unfortunately. So now we're, we'll look for a way to possibly reopen in another location or possibly not. It just depends on kind of what happens over the next several months. Yeah, tough, tough stories all, all around. Um, so I'm just gonna take a big exhale for all of you um, as we think about uh, turning to face some of the systemic uh, and structural issues uh, in the restaurant industry. So again, um, referring to uh, and using Amanda Gorman's words to uh, inspire and guide this next uh, part of our conversation. We've learned that quiet isn't always peace and the norms and notions of what just is, isn't always justice. And so with that, it made me think about the restaurant industry. And if we're really being honest, all of us uh, and everyone who's probably in the audience, which includes a number of uh, restaurant people, the restaurant industry wasn't really healthy even before COVID-19. So when the pandemic hit and governors across the country closed restaurants for dine-in service and the government did not come through with restaurant specific aid or relief, the pandemic ended up revealing and magnifying underlying systemic or structural issues in the industry. Issues that most eaters and guests were probably not even aware of or attuned to that made it especially challenging for restaurants to weather this sort of storm. 
So I'd love for each of you to share your thoughts because I realize that when we start talking about the restaurant industry as an overall system, you know, we could be here for hours uh, and still not solve that. So I'd like for each of you to share your thoughts on what particular systemic or structural issues um, particularly resonate for you and your business what issues were most challenging for each of you? And given the lack of restaurant specific relief, how did each of you try to solve things on your own and or with the help of your community, including all the many ways that you might have tried to pivot in an effort to both serve your community and survive as a business? Again, anyone can start us off here. I can start off here. Um... You Thanks. know, real quick, and maybe a little level set for everyone out there. Um, look, one of the reasons that we have a systemic problem is, uh, you know, I've been in the restaurant industry my entire adult life and and a good part of my adolescent life. Um, and, you know, 20 years ago, when I first started thinking of writing a business plan for for what would become Frosca, um, when I was an employee, um, you know, I, I worked, had a long career and I, I worked a lot of great places and I was writing that business plan. And 20 years ago, the industry average was between 17 and 20% profit. Um, 2019 was an incredible economic year for the United States of America. Uh, industry average for, if you average, uh, independent restaurants across the United States, industry average in 2019 was less than 6%. So right there, you have a big problem. What has happened? Uh, a couple things. I think a lot of people don't understand our industry. We've never, we're a lot of independents. Um, we, society from the president to city council locally needs to change. There needs to be more thought on a civic level, a, a state level, and a federal level. I'll give you a great example here in Boulder. 10 years ago when I remodeled um, Frosca, uh, that's probably when I should have started the Independent Restaurant Coalition. Uh, one of our guests, we had spoke of uh, Crispin Porter Bogusky. Uh, at that time, 10 years ago, uh, they were doing a remodel to their big space. They were, uh, you know, really building a lot and one of their president their president at the time was eating at frosca and he told me how much they got because i was about to close for a remodel he told me how much they got from the city in deferred fees and you know because they're creating jobs i was like well wait i'm i'm creating jobs so i went down to the city the next day only to find out that those fees are for everybody but restaurants pretty much sit on a civic level, even in a very enlightened city like Boulder, that gets so much from our restaurants, they don't look at us like career builder, economic builders, people that buy homes and do that. That's just how it is. And I, and I just kind of brushed myself up and just dealt with it. Here we are, uh, 10 years later, I have over 200 employees between here and Denver, but the company's based here. Crispin Porter's moving to Denver. I'm still here, still haven't gotten any, you know, anything there. But that's happening in every restaurant across America. And if you look at, at us, and I, I really think we should look at ourselves as like, let's look at biology. We're a cornerstone species in the American economic system. And you look, if you're a tech company, uh, an insurance company, a law firm, whatever, and you're moving up 200 people to a city, there's a lot done civically to help you get there. There is nothing done for restaurants. So that's just the little thing that systemically has eroded the profitability. And if, if, you, if you're an industry that gives back 94 cents of every dollar to the economy, as you said, it's a two times, every dollar creates two times to the um, local economy here, that's across the US, we need to do something. And one thing I noticed this year more than anything, very brilliant, both sides of the aisle, Republican and Democrats, 
don't understand our industry. Look, Mitch McConnell had the Restaurants Act on his desk from June 18th. If he would have reacted on it, Kendra would still be open. Many businesses would still be open. Uh, second, you know, they just don't understand us. Like I, I talked to a very famous Congress woman uh, midsummer about the Restaurants Act and her and her chief of staff and legislative director, we had a Zoom call um, and, and she's, she's great, but she just said, Bobby, I did not understand your industry. I didn't know it meant 10% of the economy or 10% of the workforce. I didn't know these things. I've been hearing from the airline industry and their CEOs for 30 years. She's very well versed on many different industries. They're just not versed on ours. And I think that's what causes a systemic problem in our industry is we're always in this barely treading water situation. So when something like this happened, we had no chance. And the fact that the PPP is nice, but it doesn't work for a business that's closed. Well, that's, uh, thank you, Bobby, for sharing all that. I think that's a great way to sort of um, set a baseline for this part of the conversation. Who else wants to uh, talk about the structural issues that resonate with them? I'll just piggyback on, on what Bobby said because clearly um, my outcome is the worst case scenario, but I think it's even felt on a independent kind of operator level when I think about the fact that as everyone was going through this um, uniquely, there was really no easy way to communicate with Carolyn or with anyone else who had one restaurant figuring it out on their own, not probably a giant team of support staff like shared services the way maybe larger restaurant groups have or certainly corporate restaurant chains have um, and maybe you do, Carolyn, I'm sorry. Um, but I, I constantly felt like every question I had, I was uniquely having to figure out and solve it, even though intellectually, I understood that clearly hundreds and thousands of other people were literally asking the same questions. And so when you are a solo operator owner like I am, you're, you're also running your operation. In my case, I was batching cocktails. I was doing deliveries, but then I was also having to look up the fine print of a million little answers to questions that I was having on an hour to hour basis, it seemed like. Forget about the supply chain inequity, forget about the fact that our customers, our guests don't really fundamentally understand that all the paper bags that we had, I never had a single takeout I mean, maybe five takeout orders in three years of operation. And then I suddenly purchased bags and then marketing materials for those bags and straws and bottles that I had never ever purchased and were not part of the business model. But we were also not raising prices so as to keep our guests engaged with us and make them feel as though we were empath you know, empathizing with their circumstances, knowing that a lot of folks maybe were um, struggling financially as well. So it just began this bitter cycle that was almost, you know, unsolvable. Obviously for me, it became unsolvable, but these were so many thoughts that I was having that I was like, how do we fundamentally change the level of understanding to Bobby's point at the government level, both federally and locally, but also to our guests, you know, we never talk about price increases and we never even wanted to ask for a living wage or a service charge, like all of these things, each of us have just struggled with like, oh, how do we, how do we make this where it's fair that my staff can afford to live in the city? We don't even speak about that. So we've got to change the dialogue from really top to bottom so that we can have a fighting chance, I mean, pandemic or not, but we've got to have a much better understanding of just, I'll call it fundamental kind of restaurant economics 101 and make sure everybody understands and then can really participate in how we can keep our industry alive. Otherwise, I, I, I just don't see how it happens. Not to be like negative, but I think I really, I just struggle with how we can survive long-term. Thank you for sharing that. Right, Caroline, I think you might have wanted to chime in. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think what Kendra brought up is is what I've been thinking about a lot. Um, definitely the guest space, understanding what what goes into a restaurant. And I think when the pandemic hit, we when we pivoted, we also wanted to make affordable food because of the neighborhood we were in. We know it's a family, um, very family oriented uh, neighborhood. And so, you know, we really marked down our prices um, for a bit, just wanting to still stay in people's homes. Um, and it just kind of felt like we were just, you know, putting ourselves out there. And at the same time, we were still wanting to support our farmers because it was spring. And that's when they make a lot of their money. I mean, not a lot, but, you know, there's CSAs that we we're a part of that we had already committed to. All these restaurants were pulling out of the CSAs. And to me, I, I couldn't. I couldn't do that. Um, I, I love, you know, our vendors. I love a lot of farmers that we work with. And so it was still really important to me to keep buying as much product as we had the previous season, um, but then also not charge, um, you know, our normal pricing so people could continue to order from us. And it just felt like this cycle where I was like, what am I doing? We're not even, we're not breaking even, we're not making money. I'm paying these farmers because I want, you know, them to make it through the season to see the next season. I also, you know, want my guest base to still be able to, um, you know, get uh, good food to go. Um, and so it was this, it was definitely a, a, just a weird moment of what are we trying to do? What, what's the end result? Is it to provide food for this neighborhood? Is it to provide, you know, a place for our farmers, vegetables that we already said we were going to um, be, you know, buying. Um, so I, I definitely had this breakdown moment of, um, it's so important for the guests to understand what, what goes into a restaurant, what does it take to make it run? Um, and I, I don't know the answer to that, how to, you know, relay that, but it, it just, it felt like a major disconnect um, between us and, and the end product. And that's never, you know, that's never the intention, but it definitely felt that way with a magnifying glass, you know, something that I had, had never felt that intensely before. So for me, it's, it's, the guest has to understand, the public has to understand what goes in to make a product, um, who all is involved in it, and, you know, sometimes, like our biggest complaint is that our food is overpriced and um, it just, I, I, I can't even, you know, begin to describe how that's not even true um, given our profit margin, but how do we, how do we relay that? How do we let, you know, how do we let the community that loves to go out to eat and loves food, um, you know, have, how, do, how does that spread to more people? Yep, good point, Caroline. Thank you for sharing. Dana or Jimmy, do you want to weigh in on this question? Well, um, <clears throat> from my perspective, I think the restaurant business is a very difficult restaurant to begin with. You really have to love it to, to do what you have to do to be successful. And it, I think in 2019, you could see in the horizon that there was going to be some problems coming our way. Uh, and COVID hit struck and nothing prepared us for it. I, never in my wildest dreams would I, would I expect to, you know, see what happened to us, the industry, the whole, the whole world, really. But, um, you, you know, it's, it's, it's a difficult, difficult business to begin with. And with this coming out of left field, it, 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 you know, it's it's hard to imagine that it's not it hasn't been worse really on a lot of these businesses. Uh, I would like to say uh, kudos to Bobby for picking up the mantle for the restaurant industry. Uh, he was out there in the very very beginning on all the news outlets, you know, talking up you know what the problems are in our industry. And uh, yeah, big, big time. And we raised money to buy food for, from restaurants to give away to the frontline people. It was a big deal. Helped a lot of people out and kudos. 
Yeah, so agree. And it makes me think of another restaurateur who made his future in politics. So we might be looking at a future governor of Colorado uh, in, our, in our presence today, just planting that seed. Danette won't allow that. <laughs> She'd be a fabulous first lady of Colorado. <laughs> Anyways, uh, we'll, we'll, have, we'll schedule a follow-up panel discussion on Bobby's political future. Um, but Dana, uh, before we move on to the final part of our conversation and address some of the questions that are coming in from the audience, uh, would you like to share anything from a Big Red F perspective on the structural issues that were really magnified by the pandemic? Sure, I'll just keep on the thread that everyone's been sort of going down um, and echo some sentiments. More a little bit on a positive note, I have always had similar frustrations the last um, three years being on the Boulder Chamber and just sort of seeing how the key industries, the, the actual key industries on paper, don't include anything that has to do with small business. And restaurants, I've been in restaurants since I was eight years old. It's I know that it's the heart and soul of a community. It is, I mean, Google and Apple, you know, I, I think they big tech companies, the five key industries, when they're looking at where they want to relocate their headquarters, they look at what's the vibrancy of that community and restaurants are the baseline of that. And I've always been very proud to be part of that. And seeing that restaurants has never been actually one of the five key industries, it's always been a struggle and something that I've been trying to combat. And I really see I'm trying to look at the silver lining and watching the mechanisms that went into place and the community and the bonding that started to happen amongst all of us in the restaurant industry through things like Eat Denver, through the CRA. But really I, I'm super proud that we have an organization like Eat Denver in Colorado because we were able to um, sort of have our voice and raise our voice collectively on a local and, and state government level that I think really did move the needle in a lot of ways. Um, we're very thankful for Bobby and Sarah Abel and all of the people who were able to, to create the um, Independent Restaurant Coalition. That's huge, especially on um, the federal level. But the local and the state level, there were a lot of battles to be fought on those, on, on those levels as well. And just seeing our industry come together to collaborate, um, I, I I know that it is probably very difficult because you can't necessarily reach out to a specific person in Kendra's case, or I don't know, but I did see um, on, the, on the broader scope, it was like, it, it was really inspiring to see everybody come together. So to me, it is a systemic problem. I do think that the guests don't really understand the position, especially the financial position that restaurants are in. And um, I think we have an opportunity now with the momentum that's been created and the spotlight that is now on restaurants um, to take that momentum and to take that collective voice and to do something with it. And I think that's the next step for us is to really try to formulate what is that plan and how do we as leaders in the restaurant industry uh, bring everybody together and really raise our voice that isn't necessarily the voice of the NRA, you know, National Restaurant Association. It might not be 100% aligned with, um, you know, even the CRA, but I think working together to try to have a public um, campaign so that our guests understand more of what we do will also help affect policy because government officials and elected officials, they pay attention to what the public pay attention to. So if we can be more vocal in our marketing and our collective voice on a public side, it will really affect um, advocacy and policy. Great points, uh, Dana. And, and on that note, I, I want to thank all of the people in the audience that are here simply because they're eaters and they're restaurant guests. Um, because the fact that you're dedicating a Monday evening to educate yourself and hear, uh, and I hope you're really hearing um, the the almost the pleading <laughs> in all of your voices um, for the general public uh, to really understand what restaurants are going through. So. Thank you to all the eaters that are in the audience and, and know that I'm not ignoring your questions. I'm keeping an eye on what's coming in uh, the chat and we're gonna be getting to some of those in just a minute. Um, so for the final part of our discussion, um, I'd like us to talk about rebuilding a new, uh, a new and a new restaurant industry. And so again, using Amanda Gorman's words uh, as inspiration for this part of our conversation, 
Um, I'll start with this. So while once we asked, how could we possibly prevail over catastrophe? Now we assert, how could catastrophe possibly prevail over us? We will not march back to what was, but move to what shall be. When day comes, we step out of the shade, aflame and unafraid. And the new dawn blooms as we free it. For there is always light, if only we are brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. So as we look ahead, I'd love to ask each of you how you envision a post-COVID-19 world and industry. What changes in particular do you want to see in the industry? And inspired by the words of Aunt Amanda Gorman, how do you plan to be the light in the industry and in the world moving forward? And I'll just start this by with a little uh, lighthearted note to say that we are seeing that there are already Vote for Bobby t-shirts uh, uh, coming in. So being the light could be running for office. Just, Make it just making that plug one more time. <laughs> Bobby Kennedy, Bobby Stuckey, there's kind of a ring there. Um, I'll volunteer to start. Thank you, Kevin. Um, Takes the pressure off of Bobby, too. Exactly. I'll let him gather his stump speech together really quickly. Um, so uh, with the closure of Bar Helix, clearly I've had uh, a little more time on my hands than I have for many, many years. And also just out of a necessity to try and create some amount of income for myself and some people that work on my team. Um, I was really inspired to start a consulting business, which is a bit of a pivot, another one, um, from the consulting work that I did before I opened the bar. And really my goal with it and our goal as a firm is to ask ourselves how we can support the hospitality industry from within. Um, and I think that just the unique perspective we bring, you know, as operators, um, as strategic thinkers, and as people who have just kind of gone through some of these really in intense challenges, um, I've just felt really called to find ways to help other operators to avoid some of the things that, that we've gone through and not even pandemic specific, but I would say that everyone probably just looks at life a little differently now than they used to. And so thinking about going in and um, just wanting to be of service to, to my industry, trying to hopefully affect more positive outcomes for more people um, has, has been interesting when you're an operator. I mean, your whole world just is trained on your, your operation. And so just trying to think about what I can do on a bigger um, level to affect change in the industry. And, and one thing I'm particularly passionate about now is um, increasing equity and opportunity and inclusivity in hospitality. Um, it's also a systemic challenge that's been facing our industry for decades. Um, but I think now more than ever, people are very, very curious about what they can do differently. Um, and again, with the pandemic causing everyone to examine their operation, I think no time like now to ask, how do you turn your business? How can your business be a force for good as well as for serving great food and drinks? Um, so just trying, you know, it's hard to put my baby to bed, but at the same time, maybe I'm just, I don't know. I feel like maybe there's a way I can do something more for my industry with others in my industry, like everyone on this panel. Great, thanks for Great sharing stuff, Kendra. Uh, I could go next. Um, first of all, awesome, Kendra, thank you. Um, you know, as we were talking right now, um, it looks like uh, President Biden is gonna include uh, a piece of the Restaurants Act in the COVID package for appropriation, and that's a big deal. Um, and that's really exciting. Um, I also think um, 
I really believe for the restaurant industry to really flourish post COVID, um, there needs to be another voice for our industry other than just the National Restaurant Association. Um, and not that I'm gonna pick on the National Restaurant Association, the other NRA, but their job to advocate for all restaurants is incongruent with small independence. So it just doesn't work. It, they, they, they can't, it's impossible for them. I've, I've, look, it's not their fault. They just can't. It's just too hard for them to do it all. So hopefully we can have an organization like the IRC, the Independent Restaurant Coalition, that can do so many things for our industry. Kendra brought up something so important earlier is like, where do you go for these that we just don't have an organization where if you have a question you can go to or advocating. I mean, the mere fact that there's more restaurant employees in the five boroughs of New York than the entire airline industry, we need someone representing all this fabric of small businesses, really, really important. So I think that could be the, the, the greatest silver lining. And also because each state and city is different and there's different challenges. We're very lucky here in Colorado that 18 months ago, we passed a chance to spread the gratuity called whole house gratuity. So here at Frosca, and I, I think, I think uh, Big Red F has been a great mentor to us to do this. I know Carolyn does that at Annette. The fact that you can spread gratuity tips to both front and back of the house is something that we can do in Colorado. But you know, in Boston, in New York, in San Francisco, you can't do that. So there's these, these systemic problems that make things that that holds our industry back and and we need to be able to hey we're great here in colorado we were lucky enough to pass that law but we need to be able as coloradoans to help the country so new york city and boston san francisco can spread gratuity out or all these little i'm just picking on that one little nuance that's so important um, there's so many things that hopefully we can do post this because it is a special industry. It's a beautiful industry and it does so much for so many people. Um, we just need to make it healthier and hopefully we can do this post, post COVID. After we're done pivoting and running, I mean, just hearing Kendra having to can open a restaurant down the street or you're paying rent at the same place. I mean, that is not, I mean, did we hear that? I mean, that's insanity. Yeah. And I feel like, so guilty that I have a Negroni and I'm not giving her a Negroni right now. Yeah. And it's like yesterday, um, I tuned in, like I'm sure some of the people in our audience did to the uh, conversation with Evan Funky of uh, Felix in Venice, California. And when, uh, you know, he, for those of you that know, he's obsessed with handcrafted pasta and in the next sentence, he was talking about AstroTurf in a, for his outdoor dining. And I just thought like the incongruity of talking about the high craft of handcrafted pasta and in the next breath talking about AstroTurf for the sidewalk. It was just, uh, it was crazy. And all the pivoting that you all have had to do is just, you know, absolutely crazy. Um, but I'll, I'll hold back my thoughts on that because I want to save more time and space for all of you to share with how you're envisioning uh, the industry anew and how you want to be a light. Yeah, I'll jump in. Um, you know, I think that the thing that I'm seeing the most of is transparency. And I think restaurants have always had a hard time being transparent, um, you know, because we, we hire maybe people who aren't citizens. We, you know, the way the tip structures always worked and I think right now is kind of this very vulnerable time where we have had to kind of show our underbelly, um, what takes place, what has to happen for us to 
survive. And it's really all out there in the open. And I think, you know, thanks to the IRC and different organizations, it's, it's been a very prominent conversation amongst the industry and it's, it's getting more mainstream. More people are talking about restaurants and what it takes. And, um, you know, I think I'm not a silver lining type of person. I'm a very pessimistic person. So it's hard for me to find silver linings, but I think that having transparency with our industry is, is super important. Um, I think so much of it has been either, you know, glorified as what we are um, being kind of like this boys club or whatever. But I think, I think that it's been really rough. Um, a lot of things coming out and, and making us transparent, but I think in the end that it can make us a healthier industry um, that certain things are being brought up, um, mental health, um, you know, the health of, uh, the, the restaurant itself, um, making money, what our profit margins are. So, you know, I, I don't think it's ever a bad idea to have more transparency. Um, I think that that's like something that we've been really, um, that we held really in high regard at Annette and, you know, showing everybody everything, all the numbers. And I just think the more we can be honest and open about what our industry is about, um, we can only go up from there. Thank you. And I know you have been doing that as one of the leading people here in Colorado, one of the first restaurants to go to a uh, flat wage, the same between the front of the house and the back of the house. You were always very vocal on social media, telling other restaurateurs that if you want to learn how to do this, just reach out to me, I'll help you. So thank you for all that you've been doing uh, in that arena and to um, advocate for transparency uh, moving forward. Yeah, they as, the, as back of the house, I had never seen a front of the house check until, until we opened. So that was, that was very eye-opening. Wow. Uh, Dana or Jimmy? Um, thoughts on the future of the industry? Yeah, I would, I would say a lot similar to what everybody else has been saying, but to me, I, I think to the couple points, one, that the average, um, the average profitability in restaurants is 6%. So we clearly have the numbers, but we don't have the financial resources like the key industries do, right? We don't have the liberty to write a check for big lobbyists and for the people who actually move the needles in the halls of Congress, right? But what we do have is we have what you started off this entire conversation with saying is everyone on here who's listening is probably a foodie, right? We have hundreds, thousands of people that walk through our door that we make personal connections with, that we make smile, that we, you know, Dave likes to say, I've had people who used to come in before they were married, when they were dating, I saw them get engaged, then I saw them get married, I catered their wedding, then now their kid works for us. And then in some cases, you know, it's just generations of customers and guests that we have these really deep relationships with. And that's where our power lies. And so for me, if I'm really going to say, how can we bring it home with this whole conversation? To me, it's let's take the, the resources that we do have, which is the love and the power of food and people and experience and all of the millions of people, you know, for 11 million people that we employ, think of all the people who we make happy and who are part of our network and our community. That's where our power is and where the people who own large corporations and the other five key industries they don't have that, you know, no one loves a tech company as, as much, well, maybe Apple, but as much as they love their neighborhood restaurants. So to me, it's like, how do we now take the momentum and the relationships that we've created with each other across the country to harness our marketing message? Because that to me is what's going to move the needle on an advocacy side. We don't have the time. We don't have the resources as far as the people or the money to, to really play that card on the other angle. So to me, it's how do we, how do we approach it from a messaging side? Thank you, Dana. Jimmy, parting thoughts on this question or do you want to save it to the end? Yeah, I, I think these, these are all great uh, uh, 
directions that we should be moving in. And uh, I really don't have anything more to contribute to what's been said. I think that's, you know, something has to be done. And, uh, you know, our government sitting on their hands for nine months hasn't helped any, anybody here. And industry is the biggest employer in the country. And the idea that they would let it flounder like this, it, you know, there's no real excuse for it. So from my perspective, uh, so more advocacy for sure. Yes, for, for sure, more advocacy. Well, as people are coming up with their questions um, and we'll address the ones that have already come through, um, but this is your official call to action uh, for uh, submit a question if you have one. And while those questions are coming in, I'd like to ask our panel um, one final uh, question, which is what is your call to action? Um, and we have been getting these questions in the chat as well, which is um, our, our, guest, our guest tonight, our audience tonight, um, is really curious what they as eaters and restaurant guests and restaurant supporters can do to best support you and restaurants um, as we move forward. Um, so um, I'd love for each of you to share uh, just in a rapid fire sort of way um, as questions are coming in, what's your one call to action that eaters can do to help us be the light and move the industry forward? I'll say rapid fire. Um, in addition to ordering takeout and you know going out to eat when you can, if you feel safe, um, if we are posting messages about our industry and the tip credit or the not tip credit or anything that has to do with legislation and truly understanding what we do, really pay attention to it. If you love us, really read what we're saying and support us on social. Like what we say, interact you know, at mention your Congress people, at mentioned your elected officials and help us really move our industry in the right direction. Feel free to just jump in. I'll stay out of the way on this one. Other calls to action. You know, I, I think uh, Dan had put it perfectly. Uh, amplifying our little voices to make them one big voice. Um, I think that's really, really important. Uh, if you see in the future legislation or possible legislation, um, you know, amplify that for sure. Um, you know, it's an industry that does so much for so many people. Um, let's make sure we keep it around. I'll piggyback on them. I, I, I think, you know, when you're voting, um, pay attention to the, the small, the small amendments, things that um, could affect small businesses. I felt like there was a lot on the ballot in Denver. And I had so many of our regulars and guests reach out and say, hey, what does this mean for your business? You know, if I vote yes on this or no on this, can you survive? Does this make sense? And I have never had that happen. And it, it did something to, you know, it was, it was, touching and we need more of that. We need people understanding what your vote does um, to the small businesses that you love. I'll say something really similar to, to Carolyn um, that might be even um, not as intimidating for people who can't necessarily navigate um, you know, some of the leg legislative things, but just reaching out period to restaurant owners, to staff, to anyone that you can have access to. Um, for me, when we were still open, you know, we got a lot of very supportive messages from people um, that just helped us to stay motivated, just saying thank you, um, acknowledging the work that everyone's doing, um, risking their health and safety to take care of you, um, just remembering to say thank you and acknowledging that. And, you know, if you get so inclined, sending a, a quick message um, through Facebook or Instagram or however you can think to contact anyone involved in, in your favorite restaurants. It just goes so much further than you could ever know. Great point, great point. 
All right. Um, I think that that is the end of our conversation. And I think we've addressed the questions that have come through, uh, which pe people were very curious what each of you thought that they could do to best support you. Um, I think we've talked about um, the tipping, the front of the house and the back of the house being one of the systemic issues. So I would just love to end um, by saying thank you um, to each of our panelists, because um, you know, as one of our um, members of the audience noted, it's really just heartbreaking. Um, and I've talked to you know several of you um, pretty regularly throughout this pandemic, and even just hearing your stories again tonight, it just continues uh, to be heartbreaking. And so I want to echo what Kendra said uh, before I turn it over to Megan uh, to close us up for the night, and to just say that you know, this is not business as usual for restaurants right now. And um, I witnessed something and I've witnessed it actually several times throughout the pandemic the other night, which was, I was picking up a takeout order and someone else came up uh, after me and just walked up to the host stand, which was outside the restaurant and just said, hi, I'm here to pick up my uh, take takeout order. Um, as if we were operating in a business as usual environment instead of realizing that the hostess that was there was wearing a mask and as Kendra said, was risking their own health to be able to serve that takeout meal. And so to just remember the humanity of the people who are serving and cooking our food and doing the dishes, um, uh, because we might be getting takeout, but they're still doing dishes for all of the uh, pots and pans that are cooking the food. Um, and, and to remember that all of us just want to be seen and appreciated and valued for being human beings. Um, and that all of these people that are here tonight are in the business of helping to make our world, our neighborhoods, our communities a better place. Um, and they deserve to be treated in a way that is not business as usual. So uh, with that, um, I will thank everyone so much again for investing an hour and 15 minutes of your time with us tonight. Um, and as Bobby had mentioned, and I think uh, was communicated to the audience, if you're interested in learning more about helping restaurants, you can visit saverestaurants.com. This will help you learn about the Restaurants Act and all of the other legislative uh, efforts and advocacy work that people like Bobby and others are doing uh, on a state and national level uh, to help save uh, the restaurant industry. And in my personal opinion, save our humanity. So thank you. And with that, back to Megan. Well, you know, sometimes things aren't always super positive, but this constructive conversation, I think, was going in the right direction. I was looking forward to this for a couple of weeks now. So thank you for attending. Thank you for participating. So on behalf of our festival director, Julia, I would like to thank each of you for participating in this because when people with the restaurant savviness and stature as yourselves participate in our small little festival, you really help just let every other one know that we're respected. And all we try to do at the Flatirons Food Film Festival is support our local restaurants. And then those random ones that are in a film that we bring in and, and it's been a year and it's not over. And thank you for participating in this tonight. And for the viewers out there, if you want to experience something that's kind of an out of the world restaurant tomorrow, tomorrow night, learn about the stuff that's going on in Bolivia. As someone who spent a month of her life in Bolivia, I can't wait to tune in tomorrow to see about fine dining down there. The festival's not over. We're going through Friday. Visit our website to uh, get the rest of the schedule. Donate if you can and just support all of our wonderful local restaurants. We're so fortunate here in Colorado to have them. And uh, we're gonna get through to the other side of this. And with that, thank you all and good night. Thank you.